there's a reason for why the video is actually a better way of transferring the information to you. The video is very effective because it uses the way humans learn, right? It uses the way humans actually assimilate information. And it's a very straightforward process, right? We, we know from a um, lot of years of science and cognitive science that the way we receive information is in two channels, the verbal channel and the, and the uh, visual channel. And when they come in together, like the video does, they complement each other to be a very powerful and effective way of receiving information. Now, this is not be surprising to any of us because that's what we do in our classrooms all the time, right? We do chalk and talk, right? And what I'm saying right now is that the multimedia presentation, which is chalk and talk or any kind of multimedia, it is, we know that for, particularly for novices, and for a lot of topics, uh, a lot of them including uh, topics and skills like we want our principal students to learn, the multimedia presentation, the chalk and talk, is the most effective way of transferring information. Now, clearly this is, you guys say, well, this guy's crazy, he's arguing for the lecture, right? And which we have been asking that the last 20 years that we get rid of the lecture and we do active learning. <laughs> That's actually not what I'm saying, right? I actually think active learning is the best thing that happened to higher education in the last 20 years. But one option we have now, and this is what I'm going to talk to you today, is to take the, the multimedia presentation, the lecture, the chalk and talk, and now we have to ask ourselves, do we need to have that in the class time? Perhaps it is cheap enough and effective enough to take it out of the classroom, <coughs> put it somewhere else in time, that you can use the classroom for active learning. All right, so what I call when flip the classroom is, the, is this model, right, in which you take the actual lecture, the chalk and talk, or the multimedia presentation, and you give it to students before they come to class, and then when they come to class, what you do is traditionally what they have been doing at home, which is the homework. All right? So then uh, you have expanded your class time in time, that now you have a lot more options, and hopefully what you will be able to, to, to do in class is to be uh, a more effective uh, teaching, not only because the students are receiving better information because you have, but also because you can actually push them a little more, all right? So I'm gonna, the, the, my goal here for the next 10 minutes is to show you how it looks uh, in um, you know, the videos and, and kind of the framework, and then show you a little bit of data that we have as to whether these things have worked, all right? From, from my classes and also from, from physics, all right? So this is the class I teach, so this is my class, and I think right now, I might be wrong, but I think I have the largest econ face-to-face -face class in the US, so I were probably, probably the one, which is, I don't know if I should be proud or be proud about that, like, I'm still <laughs> trying to figure that out. But I have 950 students. Students in my class are gonna, I'm going to, these are all organized in topics, right, and they go to, let's say, the week I cover supply and demand. There's uh, one free lecture for every class, right? So I have two classes on that week, so there's uh, one on demand, one on supply, and their students are going to have to do two things before coming to class. They have to watch the video of the uh, pre-lecture and then also complete a checkpoint activity. The whole thing should not take more than 20 to 25 minutes. And when you click on pre-lecture, what they're going to see is something like this, right? Um, with, um, with videos uh, like this one. Imagine that you're at the beach on a hot and sunny day. You've not had a drink in hours. And someone offers to sell you a soda. How much would you be willing to pay for that soda? Would you pay two dollars, or how about? So and they can they can continue to move through the through the lecture in that way, watching different videos, right? Now at some point, there's two things that you should notice here. One is that these slides are, are hidden and they won't be able to access them until they watch the one before. So we control in some way the way the student progresses through the lecture. And at some point, they're going to hit a building block or some kind of block here in which they're going to have to answer a question in order to continue to move forward. This is low stakes. They answer the question. If they get it, if they get it wrong, they get it. To, they get to try it again. When they get it right, they get to move forward. And we can give them feedback on their answers. And at the same time, I also have that answers myself. I can analyze and use in, in uh, just-in-time teaching. Right. Um, I can also use uh, just-in-time teaching to do the checkpoint question, which basically what it does is, and on this one, they try the the question, but they don't get an answer, and they also have to explain their reasoning. Uh, to the answer, and I will give them this answer uh, during the lecture. Right? So I'm collecting now uh, what's happening outside of class with what's happening uh, in class. Right? So, um, so that's a very, very quick summary of how, um, how my lecture, how the pre-lecture works. So the students have to complete this assignment that takes 20 to 25 minutes before coming to each of my class. Um, 
All right, so now I'm going to give you uh, two reasons why I think this process works. The first one I think I already told you, right, is because the, the, pro the, the, the idea of using multimedia presentations outside the classroom uh, really delivers the information in the most optimal way, right? We know that that's transfer information. But I showed you the video to give you an example, but we actually have some data on that. And a lot of the data today uh, comes from, because I've, 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 I've cleaned my classroom for two semesters already completely, but they've actually, the people of physics in my university, they've been doing this for a long time, and they have collected a lot of data on, on what they've done. And one thing they actually did at the very early is to figure out what's the value of these multimedia presentations. So what they did is they, they, they did a, a random experiment in which they brought people into the, to the lab, and they separated them into two groups. They, one group saw the, the videos of, for one lesson in physics, and then they took a 30-question exam. The other group took, uh, read a chapter of a textbook that was equivalent to the videos and answered 30 questions. And so then we were randomly able to determine what is the value of each thing, and this is what they found. So the blue is a multimedia presentation. The students who watched that presentation did a lot better than the students who read the text. Not only did they learn it better, but two weeks afterward, they had to come back and do the same exam or similar exam, and they actually were able to retain it well, a lot more than the text students. So, so I think that this is uh, kind of the, 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 the idea of what I was telling you at the beginning, that video seems to work better at certain things, and it works better the more novice you are. The second reason why I think um, this, this model works is because it optimizes classroom time. And we have a little bit of data on that too. So uh, what they did is they have, they have been asking students to answer questions before coming to class for a long time. So they can uh, compare how the students answer those questions, right? how prepared they are before coming to class in two semesters, one in which they have no pre-lectures video and one that they have pre-lecture video. So in the bottom, uh, it's a semester in which are the answers of students in the semester that they didn't watch any video. Uh, before coming to class, and the spring 08 is the one that has pre-lectures. So we will expect if the pre-lectures are working, and we do a, a scatter plot, we will expect to see all the plots in the lower in this part. Right? So that's actually what they found out. Right? So the students who actually are doing the pre-lecture, they're coming to class a lot better prepared. Right? And I found something similar with not many observations, because I'm still collecting this data. So this, I, I um, uh, yeah, I warn you that I don't have very few observations. I did it with clickers, in which I've been doing clicker questions at the beginning of the class for a long time. So now I'm going to compare the clickers answer from students in a semester that I didn't have the pre-lecture versus a semester that I had a pre-lecture and see how they did, right? I'm not on many observations, I have very few, but the pattern is clear. It's the same, right? Now, imagine this, right? So we are talking about in one lecture, you have 20% of your students know what you talk, want to talk about. In the other case, 70 or 80% of the students actually know it. This is a different classroom, and you can do different things with that uh, information, right? So you could actually do a lot more in the classroom when students are better prepared, right? Like that. So I'm going to hold the questions to the end so, I can, so we can actually go through. But, but please write down. I do want to ask, take all your questions. OK. So um, now, the, the one thing that I, uh, so I, I do think it works, and this is uh, some of the arguments, but one thing I also, we also wonder is, well, what about the students? Will they like this stuff? I mean, they're not going to do it, right? We've been asking them to read the textbook for a long time, and they don't read it, right? Um, well, also, we also have some data on how, how much to think this value, and this I am from physics. Um, this started at zero. <laughs> uh, so, um, so they actually find students in pre-lecture courses think the, cor the course is less difficult, they have a more positive attitude, and they actually th think the lecture is more valuable. Right? I collect a very similar information in my course. Uh, so this is a question, and uh, when they do the pre-lecture on elasticity, I ask them how well you understood the concept before watching the videos and doing the pre-lecture. You see that almost most of them did not. And then I ask them, this is self-assessment, right? They're telling me this. Um, after that, it kind of flips, and they, after watching the video, they feel they're a lot better prepared uh, uh, for it. They like it a lot, right? They think that they actually think it's a really, really good idea to have these pre-lecture videos. And, and again, they, uh, you can compare that with other areas of my course. I always like this graph because, you see, the online lecture 4.2 and my lecture 4.2. So, um, and I think I'm a pretty awesome lecturer, right? <laughs> so, so they like, but they like the online lecture uh, uh, as, as my lecture. Obviously, they're not comparing against each other because 
But I always like also that the TA session is not even beating the textbook, you know? <laughs> so so I, always I, I always tell my TA the textbook is beating you, right? So um, that's really long. Um, so, um, so the students actually like, like this uh, quite a bit. So uh, the key, and I, and I will take that in your question and answer, I know one of the questions you have is that what is the actual time? Again, we have a lot of data and we think the sweet spot is between two, uh, 15 to 25, right? If you ask students to do more than 25 um, by a little bit, you're gonna lose all, most of them, right? So in order for it to work, the whole activity before the lecture has to be between 15 to 25 hours. It's about 20, 21 minutes. So that means that you have to really be selective in what you actually choose them to present at the time before the lecture. All right, so before I pass it to, uh, to Selena, let me just finish with this thought, right? So I've always been interested in the, in, in, in the relationship between technology and spaces, right? So to give you some examples, right? So here's a, here was a kitchen in the late, I don't know, 1800s or whatever, right? It was a really claustrophobic space. Not many people actually visited the kitchen. Then in the as appliances got better, the kitchen expanded and became light, um, you know, brighter. More people visited the kitchen to get to the point in which the appliances were so good that both people in their relationship were actually spending a lot of time in the kitchen. They had to entertain in the kitchen, and the kitchen changed completely. And if you look at the new houses, it's an open layout because a lot of the parties actually happen in the kitchen, right? Same thing happened with the living room, right? At the beginning, people had to be close to the radio or close to the TV, so the living room was kind of claustrophobic. As the technology got better, the screens got better, more audio, you have to expand the living room, so now the space is actually very different because of the technology. This is a classroom in the late 1800s. This is a classroom. <laughs> there was a different, actually. You see that? There's actually no overhead. See that? <laughs> so there is. It did change, right? So it changed. Unfortunately, the screen comes on top of the blackboard, right? So you cannot, you can have to choose, right? Um, but what I'm trying to do, I, I think for the first time, and this is very related to what uh, Alex talked and, and Eric do, is that for the first time, technology has changed to a way that changes the cost structure. So that I think now it is cheap enough to transfer what was happening in this classroom outside. And I think if, if we succeed, I think if, that, if, if it's true, not only we will see a lot of online courses, but I think the classroom themselves will change. And I think in, in, you know, in five or 10 years, we will see more of this type of classroom because this is a better classroom to do what you can do in the classroom a lot better than in, uh, in online in a, in a lot of times, which is getting people to look at each other's eyes and talk to each other, right? The social part, that is the part that is hard to do online, and you may actually have to have some of it, but it will be kind of more like this. 